It all started with a brawl. On May 7, 1903, in Boston, where the Americans hosted the New York Highlanders for the first time, and where there was an incident of a pitcher getting run over. That sparked the fight and ignited everything. The very next season, the Americans and Highlanders face each other for the pennant during their final five games, in which the Americans won three out of five and would have played in the World Series if there was one held. In 1908, the Americans started going by the Red Sox, and five years later, the Highlanders started going by the Yankees, one year after rolling out those pinstripes we all know. A couple years later, the Red Sox were bought by this guy named Harry Frazee in the midst of their dynasty. Remember that name. Overall, led by Tris Speaker, Smokey Joe Wood, and Cy Young, the Red Sox enjoyed five World Series titles and six pennants during this period and established themselves as the premier MLB franchise while the Yankees enjoyed two 100 loss seasons and two last place finishes. Headliner alert! The Red Sox just finished sixth in the American League, and Frazee's getting impatient with Roos' money demands because he wants to produce a play, so... He's selling George the Bambino to his good friend Killing Gas L'Homme Dieu Huston over in New York for almost half a million dollars. This was no big deal though. It only started one of the biggest and longest curses in sports history and created a massive power shift. So yeah, no big deal. As such, 1918 would be the last Red Sox World Series title for a while. There were only two significant player accolades between the two for this era of Red Sox rulage, and this would also be the last era in which the Sox had an advantage over the Yanks in supremacy and head-to-head -head matchups. Babe Ruth wasn't the only one Frazee sold to the Yankees, but he was the big one, and in his second season with New York, he had a record-setting season. They would lose the Subway Series to the New York Giants. 1923 would be the first year in which they played at Yankee Stadium, and naturally, they hosted the Red Sox for the grand opening. Some other factoids for this season, 11 of 12 Yankee players were former Sox players, Babe Ruth won MVP, and the Yankees won their first World Series title to match against the Sox 5. It's all good though, because I'm sure you've never heard of the Murderer's Row, aka one of the greatest teams of all time. I almost forgot too, the Sox traded Red Ruffing to the Yankees after he wasn't very good for them, and naturally, he became a Hall of Famer with the Yankees. It didn't just stop there though, because former Sox manager Ed Barrow, who guided them to the 1918 World Series, went on to become the GM of the Yankees from 1920 to 45. You know, one of their more dominant periods in their franchise history, and also one of the more dominant periods in Major League Baseball history. They still wouldn't quite reach the Red Sox total just yet, until Joe DiMaggio came on board after Ruth retired. Then, they usurped their arch enemies. In the interim, the Red Sox enjoyed 9 last place finishes and 5 100 loss seasons, during which the Yankees won 8 championships, 11 pennants, and 6 100 win seasons. The rivalry didn't exactly lose its luster though. This power shift era brought us a shift in head-to-head -head advantages, team accomplishment advantages, and player accolade totals, and it was just the beginning for the team in the Bronx. We have a new era of Yankees baseball from the Murderer's Row, with some guys you've never heard of before, known as Yogi Berra, Mickey Mantle, and the aforementioned Joe DiMaggio. Those three combined for seven MVPs, two batting titles, and one triple crown. The Red Sox did have a guy of their own whom you might not have heard of in Ted Williams, and he had some solid hardware. It did have to hurt that the last 400 batting average season for a player resulted in losing the MVP to Joe AD though, even more so losing the MVP to Joe Gordon during his succeeding triple crown season. And then he lost to DiMaggio during his other triple crown season. He did win two though, so it wasn't all bad. Headliner alert. Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio are about to be swapped for each other after the Red Sox lost their only World Series appearance. Whoops, never mind. Larry McPhail doesn't want to include Yogi Berra in the deal. And who can blame him? 1948 saw a close pennant race between the two clubs and the Guardians until the final weekend. The Sox eliminated the Yankees at Fenway for the final series, but lost the first one-game playoff to the Guardians, which prevented an all-Boston World Series versus the Braves. The Sox still had a very good team for next season, though, and were still battling the Yankees' juggernaut for the AL pendant, with just one win needed during the final two-game set at Yankee Stadium, and they blew it. The Yankees won the pennant and the World Series as a result, and put a gap between them and the Red Sox for supremacy in Major League Baseball. 
even though they already had one. It was the first of five straight championships and 14 of 16 pennants. There was also a fight in a tunnel under the stands between Jimmy Pearsall and Billy Martin. The Yankees now have 18 World Series titles to the Red Sox 5, 13 pennants to the Sox 7, and have now been established as the premier franchise of Major League Baseball, while the Sox were still dealing with the sins of the Bambino selling. Just as a little extra note, the Cardinals had also usurped the Red Sox in titles. Either way, we did get some good Red Sox legends and some iconic Yankee legends in this era where the Bronx Bombers just won and won and won and won. This is my favorite time period of the Yankees-Red Sox rivalry, and arguably the strongest case for it, especially since the Red Sox made it more even with the head-to-head -head matchups. The Yankees still led overall, but the Red Sox kept it pretty even for this era. Things started to even out a bit amongst the MLB landscape with the rise of the Orioles, Tigers, and A's providing more competition, but the Yankees still started off winning five straight pennants, including one off the back of Roger Maris's new home run record-setting season. Meanwhile, the Red Sox were in the midst of eight straight losing seasons while Ted Williams was getting closer to retirement and one of their aces even got so worked up over a huge loss that he tried to leave for Israel. During the first Red Sox pennant winning season of this era, we got a pretty heated fight that involved body slamming that started with Yankees pitcher Thad Tilliston getting worked up over the guy who hit a grand slam the previous game. I'd like to think I'm not making that up. Since the Bambino curse was still alive and well, the Sox lost the World Series to the Cardinals in seven again. Since the other AL teams mentioned earlier started to come up and the LCS series was implemented, neither the Red Sox nor the Yankees won a pennant until 75. But the Sox were looking promising with the likes of Carl Yastrzemski and Carlton Fisk. In the interim, the rivalry started to strengthen, presumably because the Yankees weren't dominating the way they were the previous few decades. Munson's slide into Fisk in attempt to win a game broke some unwritten rules, therefore we got ourselves another altercation. Like what, the fifth now? There was also a bit of a dangerous moment with a Sox fan throwing a dart at Chris Chambliss in a game next season. The following season, the Red Sox had now formed a vaunted lineup with the likes of Jim Rice, Fred Lynn, and Dwight Evans now going along with Carl Yastrzemski and Carlton Fisk, and they swept the back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back defending World Series champs in the ALCS, en route to a three-run lead in Game 7 of the World Series. But you know how the story goes. And Cincinnati has won the world championship. So the Yankees sparked the fire again when Lou Pinella crashed into Carlton Fisk, which led to benches clearing as the two fisted it out at home plate. And another fight even occurred during that same inning of that same game. The Yankees would also lose to the Big Red Machine, just like their arch nemesis the year before. The Yankees would, however, win their 21st World Series the next season. But now it's 1978, and the Red Sox are looking to make it back to the postseason after the close race of the year before and the disappointment of 75. And they were looking good with that 14-game lead over the AL East in mid-July. On the contrary, the Yankees actually cut down the 14-game deficit to four games in September, right before a four-game set in Fenway. In George Ruth curse era fashion, Boston was outscored 42-9 in the series and four games swept. In other words, it was the Boston Massacre. Things were looking down for Boston, but the Bombers weren't able to take hold of first place and there was a tiebreaker to be held at Fenway Park. For this game, Cy Young winner Ron Guidry was facing former Yankees pitcher Mike Torres. The Sox still seemed to be good with a 2-0 lead heading into the seventh though. Deep to left! Yastrzemski will not get it, it's a home run! And never mind. The sad part is that was only Bucky's fifth home run of the season. Well, it isn't sad if you're a Yankee fan. This was by far one of the peak moments of the Red Sox-Yankees rivalry and showed that it was more than a one-sided affair despite the distinct difference in accomplishments. So the Yankees weren't as dominant this period with winning championships, but they're still ahead of the Red Sox by 17. If it's one thing the Yankees know how to do, it's add and replace talent which is why they were so successful. The Red Sox on the other end seemed to obtain results inconsistently. The Red Sox did have some players get good hardware and were set up nicely for the future though. The beginning of the 80s didn't see much from either side, but the Red Sox still had some promising pieces to work with and were primed for success. 
despite not finding it with Fisk and Yastrzemski. It seemed as though the missing piece was a young pitching phenom known as Roger Clemens, who won the Cy Young and MVP in 86, the year in which the Red Sox might look to start a power shift. The Rocket was the first pitcher MVP since Vida Blue, and the Sox enjoyed a 3-1 series comeback in the ALCS over the Angels en route to another pennant. And what a fun World Series it was for the Yankees. In a loose, loose scenario of a World Series for Yankee fans, the heavy underdog Red Sox found themselves one out away from winning it all. And a drive to left, going back on it is Mookie Wilson, and this one is gone! But you know how the story goes. Little roller up along first, behind the bat! George Herman's curse still going strong. Never fear, because the Red Sox still have a strong enough team to make it to the ALCS two years later. But they run into the juggernaut Oakland Athletics who are looking for revenge. The Red Sox still couldn't quite find their mojo two years later and got swept by the Oakland juggernaut again. There was even a book released that criticized the Red Sox for the sale of Babe Ruth during that season before they got swept again. Yankee fans also got themselves a new taunt in the process and some new signs, and some new shirts. The Red Sox continued to taper off and even traded Wade Boggs to the Yankees and wasted an elite hitting core. But brownie points for keeping the head-to-head -head matchups even for this era and having more first place finishes, I guess, and more iconic players. Here they come again. What a long 18 years that was. The likes of Derek Jeter, Bernie Williams, Paul O'Neill, Jorge Posada, and Mariana Rivera sparked a new era for Yankees baseball with 96 only being the beginning. Oh, Wade Boggs won with them too. I forgot about that. Brocious, fittingly with a throw, and the Yankees have done it again. They did it again, and again, and again. One of those teams just so happened to be one of the greatest of all time, and another one of those teams happened to have a killer postseason run, with only one loss in the postseason overall. Want to take a guess as to who they lost to? You got it! This was the first and long-awaited playoff series between the two franchises since 95 introduced more playoff teams, and it was short, but exciting. Swung on a drill deep to center field, going back Lewis, still back, looking up, see ya! Some other fun facts before we get to the turn of the millennium. The Yankees acquired Roger Clemens from Toronto via trade after he had been the back-to-back -back Cy Young and Triple Crown winner, and their only loss in that 99 postseason was when his former team battered him around. A young phenom by the name of Pedro Martinez pitched a gem that game as well, after he had already struck out 17 Yankees in September the most ever against a Yankees team in a nine-inning game. That was it. I didn't say there were very many. Anyway, included in the year 2000 was the most lopsided victory for an away team at Fenway of all time, and the Yankees had only won 87 games, but that was enough for the AL East division title, as the Red Sox were getting close to the end of their brief rebuild post Boggs, Evans, Rice, Clemens era. Although, to be fair, they already had acquired some pretty solid pieces, so it wasn't much of a rebuild. The Yankees, on the other hand, were still in the midst of their dominance of winning pennants at the minimum by winning 6 of 8 for this era. Tragedy did hit a couple of times here in which the Red Sox reminded us some things are bigger than baseball. In 2002, however, the Sox asked the Yankees for permission to interview former Yankees GM Gene Michael to be their new GM but Steinbrenner refused. So, I'm not sure if the name Theo Epstein means anything to you, but he became the youngest GM in MLB history and plays a major part in the next era. The Red Sox already had something brewing and now were primed to end the curse. As such, they were favorites to make the World Series in 2003 and anticipated to face the Cubs. But first, they'd have to face their bitter rivals in the ALCS just as the doctor ordered. Since the MLB had increased the amount of division games for every team two years earlier, this series going to seven made it the most times two teams had faced each other in a single MLB season. This series gave us the disagreements and, this is over the head and, and the fights we'd grown accustomed to in this rivalry. A Boston groundskeeper even was a victim. Nonetheless, the Red Sox had a 5-2 lead in game seven. This one is at the wall and gone. 
and were primed to make it to the World Series, just as projected. A flare in the center field. Out is Walker, won't get it. The base running of Matt Zoe. He comes home. Nobody covers second. Tie game. I spoke a tad prematurely. As Boone hits it to deep left, that might send the Yankees to the World Series. Despite the Sox not achieving much success in this era and the Yankees achieving all the success, this should be remembered for the buildup of the slight power shift between the two iconic franchises. Headliner alert! A Rod is about to be sent to Boston for Manny Ramirez. Well, never mind. MLBPA doesn't like all the money he'd be getting at the back end of his contract. Headliner alert! Seriously, this time. A Rod is going to the Yankees for the young phenom Alfonso Soriano and eventually. Joaquin Arias, because the Yankees keep not winning the World Series. So, we've got ourselves some juiciness with Alexander Rodriguez now being in his hometown. The Red Sox being led by Manny Ramirez, Jason Veritek, Johnny Damon, and David Ortiz in that hitting core was supplemented nicely with a solid one-two punch of Kurt Schilling and Pedro Martinez, and primed for more battles with the team from the Bronx. A-Rod got heated because Bronson Arroyo beamed him, benches cleared, and A-Rod basically begged Jason Veritek to punch him in the face. You know, your typical Red Sox-Yankees Friday. The Yankees better Pedro, he called the Yankees his daddy, and spoon-fed Yankee fans another taunt. This was the seventh straight season the Red Sox would come in second to their major rivals, and I think everyone was anticipating and hoping for a rematch between these two loaded teams. Both clubs had easily dispatched their division round opponents and set up the rematch. And it was a disappointment to start. A 19-8 Game 3 victory gave the Bronx Bombers a 3-0 series lead, and they had their untouchable closer Mariano Rivera in during the ninth of Game 4 to preserve a one-game lead. Up the middle, Roberts will come to the plate. The throw by Williams. Bill Miller has tied it. When the perfect plan crashes into the Hindenburg. Ortiz into deep right field. Back is Sheffield. We'll see you later tonight. Then we have a game five where the same thing happens again, basically. In the air to center field. That should tie it. And it's a 4-4 game. Ortiz fights it off center field. Damon run into the plate. And he can keep on running to New York. So we're back in the city that never sleeps, with the third chance for the Bombers to return to the World Series. Only Kurt Schilling masterclassed a Bo Sox victory and a tied series. Two, two, two. Sierra strikes out. And the first instance of a 3-0 series lead turning into a Game 7. Kurt Schilling also pitched through an injury for this game and his bloody sock became a token for this victory. The two best teams in baseball going the distance for the second straight season. So what happened again? Even for the Yankees, that's embarrassing. Here it is, ground ball to second. Reese, the Boston Red Sox have won the pennant. And I'm pretty sure you know the rest by this point. Back to full. Red Sox fans have longed to hear it. The Boston Red Sox are world champions. It was a long time coming for Boston. They no longer have to worry about the spirit of Babe Ruth haunting them anymore. Anyway, because Yankee fans had to feel superior at every turn, they started new taunts on opening day of 2005. Neither team would appear in the ALCS this season or the next season, but Johnny Damon did leave the Sox for their major rival routes. Also, the Yankees pulled off a five-game sweep of the Sox, the son of Massacre, if you will. Headliner alert! Roger Clemens is coming out of retirement to help the Yankees overcome a 14-game deficit. And he succeeded. It didn't stop the Red Sox from attaining their first AL East title since 95, but the Yankees made the playoffs. 
They also steamrolled the NL pennant winners in which Scott Boris tried to sham a story redirected from the Red Sox winning the World Series. This postseason was pretty boring anyway. Speaking of boring, the feuds between the two clubs that followed after the Sox second title of the millennium were very mild and a bit corny. But hey, the Rays are a new threat in the AL East and starting a rivalry with the Sox. Also, the Yankees have number 27 now. The Yankees are back on top! They would lose the pennant the next season, however, with the Red Sox keeping them from winning the AL East in the process. The Sox had a pretty big offseason after and were leading the AL East most of the season, but they had themselves a blowjob of their own. It was the first time in baseball history that a nine-game lead was lost in September. We all know about the greatest day in baseball history, though. The Yankees lost in the ALDS as they had started to taper off. Speaking of tapering off, the Red Sox had a bit of a disastrous, or at least disappointing, 2012 season and sold their pieces at the deadline. The Yankees, on the other end, couldn't handle the Tigers. Never fear for the Red Sox because they made value and clubhouse friendly acquisitions in the offseason and became the 11th worst to first team in MLB history. Also the first team since 91 to win the World Series after finishing in last place the year before. What happened to the Yankees? They missed the playoffs. This was the period in which they were sort of transitioning from their 2009 World Series core. Sandman retired and then Jeter retired next year. This era was all about the Red Sox getting their mojo and glory back after a near century absence. Even though the Yankees still hold a distinct advantage amongst pretty much every category, the Red Sox success was a long time coming and actually celebrated by everyone in the beginning. Key words, in the beginning. After some passable seasons overall, both teams were looking primed for battle in 2018, with the Red Sox acquiring star pitcher Chris Sale prior to 2017, and the Yankees taking advantage of another Marlins fire sale by acquiring Giancarlo Stanton. And it was interesting. Here he comes! On the run! As expected, the internet exploded after this, and there was also a lot of buzz after the Sox four-game sweep at Fenway. Again, I'm sure a lot of us remember this, but it's still some juiciness that serves as a good reminder. This was the first season in which both teams won 100 games, and since the A's had a very flawed and not conducive to postseason success approach to the game of baseball, the Yankees beat them and set up the fourth postseason matchup against the Red Sox. Famous last words. This would also lead to Boston's fourth title Red Sox win the World Series. in this millennium, compared to the Yankees really only having one. One other milestone, the Red Sox and Yankees were the first two MLB teams to play games in Europe the next season. And lastly, the Red Sox and Yankees had their fifth postseason matchup during the 2021 wildcard game, a game the Red Sox won. He makes the catch and the Red Sox move on! So overall, the Yankees are still by far the more accomplished franchise despite the light shift in power, specifically in the 2010s, but the Red Sox have had a solid story to their franchise. In a way, it kind of reminds me of the North London Derby. Sort of. Maybe the Manchester Derby is more comparable. Either way, rivalries are without a doubt some of the best parts in sports, with the Yankees-Red Sox rivalry giving us some of the best moments. There might be a bit of a break right now, but the best rivalries never truly die. If you want to watch more rivalry videos, I went through every MLB team's biggest rivals according to fan data five years ago, and about a month ago. I've got more videos like these planned as well, so stay tuned.